G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy and in today's video we're going to look at the first free agency moves that have happened across the AFL. Of course, free agency period has opened and within the first couple of days we've seen some fairly big deals. As usual, GWS are well and truly active in this free agency period, but this year it is for all the wrong reasons. We'll start off at the top with Zach Williams, who has left the Giants to join Carlton on a six-year deal. They've received peak 10 compensation. On the Blues side of things, this is probably one of the more significant free agency moves. One thing they probably needed to address with their list was both players in that 25 to 26 sort of age, sort of experienced players who are ready to take them to the next level. In particular, guys running well in particular, guys who can provide rebound off the halfback flank. And probably Zach Williams may be the best halfback option on the market so far. And it's probably the case that Zach Williams is well and truly the best halfback on offer this free agency period. Cade Simpson's obviously retired after having a long, brilliant career at the Blues. So they obviously needed a bit of a replacement there. So with Williams and alongside potentially Adam Sard as well, the Blues have made two potential very good moves this offseason. We also saw Aiden Core leave the Giants for the Bruce. He signed a five-year deal. He's 26 years old. That's kind of a no-brainer from his perspective. And for the Bruce, they recruit a another mature talent who they kind of need as well to sort of bridge that list profile gap. He finished ninth in their best and fairest. And as a lockdown defender, he can definitely play a role for the Ruse next season. One of the juicier moves so far that I've seen is Isaac Smith leaving the Hawks to join Geelong. When this one was first reported, it was between Melbourne and Geelong that he was going to pick. And I'm kind of surprised that a Hawthorne player would actually walk out and move to Geelong. I guess that rivalry doesn't seem to impact trades too much. I just didn't think a player would move to what is more or less a traditional rival. He's turned down a three three-year deal at Melbourne to sign with the Cats on a two-year deal and as such Hawthorne get pick 42 compensation but I think this is a massive move this is a team that obviously made the grand final weren't too far off winning the flag and we know about Jeremy Cameron nominated the Cats Isaac Smith joining him as well is quite ominous and a pretty good replacement for someone like a Gary Abler who's obviously leaving the club I think Smith has plenty to offer a club even at his age especially with his speed and skill I think that is a very very shrewd pickup for the Cats and it looks Looks like Smith said he's excited to play with Jeremy Cameron and Sean Higgins next year. And the article goes on to say that Sean Higgins is considered a lock to join Geelong at the start of the trade period. So Geelong making serious moves already. We know Joe Danaher has obviously moved north as well to join the Lions. And it looks like the Dons will be getting band one compensation, which at this stage looks like it's about pick seven. Overall, that's not a too bad a deal considering what they were offered last year. I believe it was something around the lines of pick five and 23 from Sydney. So to wait a year, I did fear that they might cop a big loss on what was originally offered, but pick seven is a fairly good deal. We know what Danaher's capable of. He was All-Australian in 2017. He's played 108 games. He won their best and fairest that year as well. Obviously, in the last three years, I think he's played something like 15 games and hasn't really put it together. So all in all, pick seven is very, very good compensation for a player that hasn't done a lot for a while. On the line side of the ledger, though, you can more or less see why they do it. Obviously, as a free agent, they don't have to give anything up in a trade and maybe a key forward presence was maybe one thing they kind of lacked in an otherwise very strong team. You've got Hipwood and McStay up forward there, but Danaher really adds something different. And while he has been inconsistent in recent years, he can sort of turn momentum of a game off his own boot as well. So I think he will add a really good foil to someone like an Eric Hipwood, who I think will actually benefit massively from having Danaher in that forward line as well. It's a far cry from where Brisbane were a few years ago. They've almost become a little bit of a destination club, as Simon Black was suggesting. Lockie Neal obviously had no link to Queen. Queensland signed the club purely because he rated their future and you have to think Joe Danaher has similar motivations obviously wanted to get out of Melbourne but to move to Brisbane who were considered you know a bit of a basket case something like four or five years ago it really does show how far this club has come. Another deal as well is Gold Coast sort of shoring up their mature age ranks, adding a mature midfielder in 26-year-old Rory Atkins from the Crows that offered him a massive five-year deal. So from his perspective, you don't really turn that down because he couldn't really crack a consistent game in a side that ended up winning the wooden spoon anyway. So Adelaide receive an end of second round pick at the moment, which is 36 at the time of this transaction. So that's not a bad deal for a player that wasn't really going to cut it and wasn't part of their future anyway. And from Gold Coast perspective, they get some mature midfield talent. Obviously, there's a lot of young 
young talent there, but someone who can sort of serve as a big body, there's a fair bit of upside there. To be fair, if he's offered a five-year deal, there must be someone they think can play a role for, you know, pretty much the length of that contract. So maybe they do genuinely have him as a part of their future plans. In more Adelaide-related news, it does appear that Brad Crouch won't garner pick two as compensation for his free agency move to the Saints. This kind of surprises me because it's more or less based on the offer. It should really be a band one compensation if he's getting a half decent deal from St. Kilda, which I would have thought he would be. The difference between band one and band two in this case is pick two and pick 23, so a fairly significant jump. This really does call into question, in my opinion, the legitimacy around the decision-making process for this compensation. We all know it's not transparent. There is no strict formula. It's based more or less on gut feel and a few other variables. I do have to wonder though, if Brad Crouch was a Gold Coast Suns player last year and he'd walked out on the club this probably would be band one compensation so maybe they think Adelaide can cop this loss a little bit better without getting into that too much Adelaide are now on the clock and have to decide whether they're going to match the contract offer for Brad Crouch which would result in a trade or accept pick 23 as compensation and St Kilda hold pick 17 at the moment but they are adamant they're not going to use that in a trade I'm not too sure why because I feel like that is a bit of a slam dunk from St Kilda maybe they're bluffing Brad Crouch despite his off-field indiscretions is a very talented player fits the mold at St Kilda and to not offer pick 17 it's a little bit cheap and as far as I'm concerned another club should smell the blood here and try and get Brad Crouch to move to there. Now what is interesting is the Crows did originally come out and say that if they didn't get banned one compensation aka pick two they were going to match the bid. Now it's been a couple of days and they haven't so you have to wonder what's going on there. Why haven't they matched? Are they doing negotiating behind the scenes? Surely pick 23 on its own is not tempting compensation. They've come out and said what they have up their sleeve is that Brad doesn't really want to leave, but he's also come out and said that he needs a fresh start. So again, I think that might be a little bit of BS. The only real conclusion I can make is that Adelaide is seriously considering accepting pick 23 as compensation. Whichever way you slice it, that is a rough burn and a big loss to a struggling footy club. Now, obviously, you know, last week I did a video on Adam Trelaw and all the business that is unfolding there, and it really does seem to be descending into a shit show. There was a report that came out that Buckley apparently told Trelaw that the playing group didn't want Trelaw around anymore, and then Buckley came out on Twitter and refuted this. So I don't really know what to believe, and it does appear that Hawthorne aren't overly interested in attracting Trelaw. Graham Wright's come out and said that they're focused on getting the list younger, but they are sort of watching the situation as it unfolds. I honestly have no idea how this plays out. As far as I'm concerned, he's just as likely to stay as he is to leave. But the talk that doesn't seem to be going away is that Collingwood have been really aggressive this offseason, putting Trelaw apparently on the trade table. Along with Jaden Stevenson, Mason Cox's name has been floated, and Tom Phillips has also been told he's no longer wanted by the club. On top of that, they got young Nick Dacos to consider in next year's draft as well, potentially a number one pick. And it seems as though they're going to exploit their connection to him as well and potentially trade their first rounder next year. So Collingwood obviously have a lot of trade bargaining power here to try and improve their list. And it's going to be interesting to see how this all unfolds. Speaking of shit shows, Jesse Hogan has officially requested a trade to the GWS Giants after two miserable years at Fremantle. He played 18 games, kicked 19 goals. This was more or less Fremantle fans' dream trade for a number of years while he was killing it at Melbourne. They eventually traded him in for pick six and 23. And for context, pick six that year made it to Gold Coast and they took Ben King. Now, to be fair, Jesse Hogan really probably is the only one to blame for this. And I think he sort of acknowledges that by apologizing to the fans. He had a number of off-field indiscretions. Obviously, he's got a little bit going on in his personal life as well, and he never really put it together at Fremantle. What is interesting is that Justin Longmuir and the new regime at Fremantle are clearly taking a no-nonsense approach, and they've been really harsh with their attitudes to someone like a Jesse Hogan, someone like Connor Blakely as well, who's had a little bit of off-field issues as well to consider, and he's definitely talented enough to make the team, and Cam McCarthy as well being forced out of the list. It shows that these guys won't take any bullshit, and I respect that. So this could be a little bit of a new era at Fremantle as well. They're obviously going to be cutting some losses. It'll be interesting to see what kind of compensation they seek for Jesse Hogan. Pick 30 is held by GWS, so they might push for that. But when a player more or less is told he's not part of the future of the club and they, it seems, want to get rid of him, it might be more like something like pick 44, which the Giants also hold. But anyway, guys, that is me more or less trying to make sense of the barrage of information we're receiving pretty much daily at the moment around AFL trades and free agency. I will be continuing to make content content over this little period as well. So stay subscribed, subscribe if you're new, like the video if you can, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.